Um, good evening, everybody, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and, and distinguished guests. Uh, my name is Helen Nicholson. I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor External Engagement at the University of Otago, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you this evening and um, to thank Ms. Sarah Dowie for, on behalf of the University for hosting us for this tonight's final lecture in the Winter Lecture Series. Um, the un University is really pleased and honoured to be able to present these lectures in the Parliament buildings. Now, those of you who were here last week will remember that we had a lecture presented by um, Professor Greg Cook. But while we were sitting here, there was another event going on upstairs, and that was the 2016 Prime Minister's Tertiary Teaching Excellence Awards. Um, these awards are an annual event um, that celebrate New Zealand's finest tertiary teachers. And it's judged by members of the community, uh, the wider community and colleagues. So the university were very proud to have four of their uh, teachers nominated for an award last year, last week. And I'm very proud to say that all four of our teachers who were nominated won the awards that they were nominated for. So these were um, Professor Jacinta Ruru from the Faculty of Law, who was one of two sustained excellence winners in the Kaupapa Māori category. And in the general category, we had Dr. Judith Baitup, who's a colleague of Dr. Greg Cook from Microbiology, Professor Daryl Tong from our dental school, and Rachel Zajek from Psychology. There was a fifth award that evening, and that's the highest accolade of the event, the Prime Minister's Supreme Award. And that award was given to Professor Jacinta Ruru. So to get that award, um, it's considered the, uh, the ultimate uh, award of the teaching component of uh, what a university does. And it's an extraordinary achievement and one that Jacinta is obviously very proud of. But I guess as a university, we're very proud because it's the fifth time in a year, in fifth one in five years time that we've won this Supreme Award. And it just goes to highlight the fact that not only does the university do excellent research, but it also takes its role as being an excellent teacher as, uh, as an important part. So whilst talking about our excellent um, academic community, I'm very pleased to, to be joined in Wellington this evening by Associate, Associate Professor Tony Reader, and he's going to present our final Winter Lecture Series talk. But I should now like to interview, uh, introduce Sarah Dowie, who's um, going to introduce our lecturer. Well, thank you very much, Helen. And thank you, everyone, uh, for tuning up tonight. I am delighted to be able to host the University of Otago's 2016 Winter Lecture Series here at Parliament this evening. As I am an alumni member of the university class of 1998, I feel a strong connection uh, towards this evening's event. And 1998 does seem like a lifetime ago that I was doing the uh, triangle between the university library, the Captain Cook Tavern and the bowler. Can you believe it? Um, I don't even know if those pubs actually exist now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pleased to report that I did graduate with a law and science degree, so my time at university was not wasted. <laughs> Tonight marks the sixth and final lecture in this year's series, which will be presented by our Associate Professor Tony Reader. Tony's research career began in Dunedin in the Dunedin Multidisciplinary Health and Development Research Unit, where he contributed to the healthy physical activity and injury prevention aspects of the internationally acclaimed Dunedin Longitudinal Study. He was subsequently appointed research fellow in the Injury Prevention Research Unit, where he completed a PhD in preventative and social medicine and held a Health Research Council postdoctoral fellowship and later joined the Hugh Adam Cancer Epidemiology Unit. Today, Associate Professor Rita is co-director of the Cancer Society Social and Behavioural Research Unit, and he has authored almost 100 publications in peer-reviewed journals. His recent work has focused on skin cancer primary prevention and includes studies of practices in New Zealand schools and workplaces. 
His lecture is entitled Ultraviolet and the Sun Smart Kid, and he will discuss for us the promising but neglected methods of primary prevention of skin cancer in the New Zealand context. And so with that, would you please welcome uh, Associate Professor Tony Reader. Secreted my notes down the back there earlier on. <laughs> Just nobody moved them, fortunately. Um, thank you very much, sir, for that introduction, and thank you, Helen, um, for introducing me and for the University of Otago for supporting this lecture series. And Tanakota Kato, welcome everybody. Uh, it's good to see you here this evening. Now. When I worked in the Dunedin Longitudinal Study, was mentioned just now, the former director, Dr. Phil Silver, used to remind us that if we saw a turtle on the top of a fence post, we could be certain that it didn't get there by itself. <laughs> so I need to acknowledge the contributions made by my co-workers to the content of this presentation and the support received from the Cancer Society of New Zealand and the University of Otago. Now, the general theme of this Otago University Winter Lecture Series is challenging the status quo in New Zealand and I hope to do a bit of that. But it's useful to bear in mind that um, there are th some things in life um, that we can and should try to change and other things that we may interfere with at our peril. Now the electromagnetic spectrum emitted by our sun provides elements that are essential for human life on Earth. Among these are the warmth and the light represented along the longer wave banks, banks longer wave length, sorry, I'm looking for the pointer on the right there, and moving left beyond the violet band of light through to the ultraviolet um, here. And that's what is visible at the inner edge of primary rainbows. So beyond the violet is known as the ultraviolet radiation. It's usually not visible to the human eye. Almost all UVR that reaches the surface of the Earth is the longer wavelength, lower energy UVA, but some of the more biologically active UVB that is not absorbed by the ozone layer or the upper atmosphere is also reaches the surface. Now, terrestrial life on Earth would be severely negatively affected if ultraviolet radiation if it was not filtered out. So the ozone layer here protects life on Earth. Some local factors can influence UVR levels. For example, UVR in our immediate surroundings, known as ambient UVR, increases with altitude by about 5% for every 1,000 metres. And cloud cover can attenuate clear sky level UVR. And it's also elevated by the albedo or reflectivity of water and snow. And fresh snow can reflect about 80%, as anybody who's been burnt up inside their nose from reflected light will know it's very painful. However, there are a number of generic environmental factors that more broadly determine the UVR levels that we experienced, and some of these have particular significance for New Zealand. Some factors can be influenced by human activities. For example, atmospheric pollution or aerosol levels can cause up to a 20% reduction in the experience of UVR in the Northern Hemisphere. But this hardly affects New Zealand because our southern skies are at the moment relatively unpolluted. So what are the main geophysical environmental factors that affect UVR levels in New Zealand? In 1980s, there was a lot of concern about the release of chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, and other industrial produced chemicals that were depleting the protective ozone layer. And ozone declined about 6% pre, um, to below the pre-1980 levels between 1980 and 1996. For the mid-latitudes, it's 35 to 60 degrees south. In this NASA image, the mean area of ozone depletion, the blue so-called ozone hole, was one of the largest ever experienced. And decreases of ozone up to 10% were reported in New Zealand in the month following the breakup of this Antarctic event, with associated patchy increases in UVB during spring months. And lately, ozone recovery has been in the news. And if the Montreal Protocol had not been implemented and been affected, 
we've now been routinely experiencing significantly elevated UVR levels and heading towards being literally fried later this century when the level of ultraviolet radiation in the higher levels of the ultraviolet index, a scientific measure of ultraviolet radiation I'll come back to in a minute, it was projected to about double from the current New Zealand maximum. And this you can see in this slide uh, down here, this is the, what we were projected to experience if the Montreal Protocol hadn't been signed, and this is what is now predicted, the more um, benign expected future. That this world avoided scenario on the right is not happening illustrates not only how benign environmental processes can be disrupted by human activities, but also how the need and means to rectify our mistakes can be identified by science and the effect of social responses for our collective protection can be implemented. So fortunately, as I say, we're heading towards the more benign expected future. Now, ozone depletion provided us with a warning it had some effect on raising UVR levels in New Zealand, but it's very important to be aware that it's other factors in particular, latitude, season and time of day that largely determine the residual already high levels of seasonal UVR experienced here. And it's to these that we need to respond sensibly by applying our scientific understanding. With respect to latitude, those areas that lie closest to the equator tend to have the highest UVR levels. Aotearoa, New Zealand, lies between about 35 and 47 south. But when we consider the UVR levels, it's instructive to compare our location in the southern hemisphere with its northern hemisphere equivalent. Superimposed on the inverted antipodes, the latitude of the south island of New Zealand aligns with northern and central Italy. The north island was central Spain and Northland with Morocco and North Africa. The entire United Kingdom, which you probably won't recognise, it's upside down like that, but <laughs> it's down the bottom of the slide, experiences significantly lower UVR. With respect to seasons, there is a further significant difference in that New Zealand experiences peak summer erythema or sunburning ultraviolet levels are about 40% higher than those at equivalent northern hemisphere latitudes. This difference broadly indicated along the extended UVR scale down the bottom here, one up to the other end, um, is due to a combination of factors and these include the lack of atmospheric pollution that I mentioned earlier but also the elliptical orbit of the Earth. This means that the Sun is relatively closer during the southern hemisphere summer. And this is the period when, because of the axial tilt of the Earth, the sunlight strikes us most directly. This, of course, is a bit exaggerated, but it does prove the point, I think. And finally, UVR levels vary by time of day, according to the solar zenith angle, or the height of the sun in the sky. The consequences of this are demonstrated in the original Australian alert bell curve here. You can see the time of day along the bottom here, and, and the the levels of UV along the side there. It's informative, this uh, diagram, I think, about the science behind UVR variation throughout the day. Unlike uh, helped, uh, I'm sad to say, I think the New Zealand one, the orange and black alert, it's a sort of a dumbed down version, which is clearly not correct because it seems to suggest that the risk is the same throughout the day, whereas in fact we know it isn't. Fortunately, a more um, better designed alternative uh, has now been designed by uh, Richard McKenzie and people at NIWA and promoted by him and the Cancer Society. And that's an app that you can download um, available for Android and other devices now. Now on the oops, go, left hand side of this slide, the seasonal variation in mean and UV, peak UV levels, that's the um, the peak ones at the top and the mean ones down the bottom and the, <coughs> the places down the left-hand side there. You can see that the highest levels in the northern regions, as you'd expect, and the lowest levels in the south. In Vicargill, Sarah down here. <laughs> and make sure you keep it on the, on the screen. Um, at the right-hand side of the screen are the levels of ambient or erythemal UV that's according to the um, internationally agreed ultraviolet index from the green at the top, the low levels, 
uh, to the purple, the extreme levels at the bottom. And the index values are associated with particular risk to, of harm to humans from unprotected exposure. And the scales, I said, extends from low through to high, or extreme, in fact, as they term it. Now, this UVR exposure involves an energy transfer from the sun to the skin, and excess exposure is essentially a type of radiation burn, an injury with potential short and long-term outcomes and cumulative effects. So it can be useful to view skin cancer in terms of Haddon's injury prevention matrix to help structure and guide efforts to reduce the negative impact of excess exposure by extending the classical epidemiological triad of an agent, here UVR, a host, um, that's the affected person, and a disease, here skin cancer. And to also include uh, socio-cultural factors in the physical environment and stages in the process too. With sunburn as the event to be avoided, the skin cancer primary prevention focuses on pre-event and event areas and these, the cells in those areas. Um, and I would say that this model has proved useful in conceptualising injury prevention. And given that John Langley, in the, who was the director of the IPRU and was my primary PhD supervisor, I've not been able to forget it. In a pro paper appropriately entitled On the Escape of Tigers, Haddon also described 10 protective strategies against harmful energy transfers. The first of these was to prevent the creation of a hazard in the first place, which was applied to CFCs, but, as I mentioned earlier. But two of the others are most relevant here. One is what we call separation in time and space. For example, rescheduling outdoor activities outside peak UVR periods. And the second is the use of material barriers, for example, shade structures, clothing and sunscreen. I'll stay with this slide for a while because too much stuff to put on it otherwise, um, so I'll just speak to it. Haddon also promoted the idea of distinguishing measures along an active-passive dimension, the active ones that require people to do something in order for their personal protection to be determined. For example, putting on some protective hat and sunscreen before going outdoors, whereas the passive ones provide collective protection through prior planning, for example, shade structures provided by the organisers responsible for outdoor public events. Generally speaking, the passive measures tend to be the most effective. For example, the shade structure can protect a succession of people through time. We know that a number of readily available barriers can reduce UVR exposure. For example, Peter Gies of the Australian Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety Agency has demonstrated the protectiveness of broad-brimmed and bucket hats and, in contrast, the limited protection afforded by uh, the um, caps, particularly the ones without flaps that shade the neck and ears. Now, these caps can effectively reduce eye glare and dazzle and promote corporate logos, but without the neck flaps, they should never be recommended for cancer prevention. Shade is a readily potential modifiable physical environmental factor, and that can be vegetation, natural physical photography, topography, or permanent demantable or adjustable shade. And UVR can be received directly from the solar disk, or scattered indirectly from the sky or reflected from terrestrial services. In some circumstances, more than half of the UVR that we receive reaches us indirectly. There's this um, elegant diagram by Christina Mackay from the Victoria University here um, that's constructed. The optimal design and placement of shade requires professional input, but the basic principle and a range of examples were described in the sadly underutilised undercover guidelines published by the Cancer Society. However, both the provision and the use of shade as cancer prevention strategies are influenced by socio-cultural factors such as institutional policies and social norms. Other research has demonstrated how clothing coverage can effectively reduce UVR exposure, and Adele Green and colleagues have demonstrated that sunscreen provides a protective barrier that can prevent the development of sun skin cancers. Sorry about this being a bit blurry, but it's the original one from 19, 
86, the original Ottawa Charter. It's a health promotion model which many of you, particularly Louise down here, will be very familiar with. And I say that it's very compatible with the Haddon Matrix as sort of reinforcing a systematic approach to re guiding responses to a problem. For example, there's a need to design support of outdoor environments um, so that they can provide collective shade protection to create social and cultural environments that are supportive of some protective practices, for example, through institutional policies and practices, and to support education and the development of personal skills. That is, we, the hosts, can be appropriately protective both of ourselves and those in our care. All of these components are best treated as mutually reinforcing. The desired preventive outcome is more likely to result from taking a comprehensive approach that addresses multiple strategies in as many cells of the hidden matrix, as I showed, as possible. And this is why such a systematic, comprehensive perspective can be so valuable for informing and guiding a comprehensive scientific approach to primary prevention. With respect to host factors, although UVR exposure triggers tanning responses in skin cells, this is not sufficient for physiological self-protection, most notably among the lighter coloured skin types for whom excess exposure can lead to erythema or sunburn easily occurring. Now it's also important to remember that the exposure of human skin to the UVB band of radiation also triggers the endogenous or personal production of vitamin D that's essential for skeletal health. Excess production of vitamin D is ingeniously avoided as the process goes into reverse when levels begin to exceed what are physiologically desirable. The 2012 uh, consensus statement up in the top corner there um, describes how by using a combination of shade, clothing cover and sunscreen when the UVI is three or above, healthy vitamin D levels can be maintained from relatively brief exposure times while harmful excess UVR exposure can be avoided. A UVI of three is the trigger level identified by the WHO when at-risk groups should adopt some protective practices. So the goal is to uh, approximate to the point B in Robin Lucas's diagram here. Um, unfortunately, the peak experience of discomfort from overexposure to UVR, experienced as red, sore or blistered skin, is delayed for 24 hours or more, reducing the likelihood of any behavioural avoidance response to protect against DNA damage that occurs and is linked with the later emergence of skin cancer. Whereas we immediately seek to avoid the dazzle experienced from visible light, we do not respond similarly to excessive UVR because it's invisible, mostly, to the human eye and the experience of physical discomfort is, delay is delayed, as I said. Similarly, during high temperatures, we tend to respond more quickly and behaviourally to seeking out, by seeking out cool shade, as do other species. I often wonder whether the pilot is still in there waiting to come out or is trying to get back. But now, in equatorial regions, high temperatures around solar noon are associated with the highest levels of UVR. So seeking shade to avoid overheating also provides protection against erythema. But in more temperate regions, like in New Zealand, while the UVI may be relatively high, the temperature may simultaneously be quite cool and therefore not elicit a protective shade-seeking response. And this is why the provision of warm shade is so important in New Zealand. Now, in the pre-event host cells of the Haddon matrix, the key population level factor affecting potential human impact of UVR is skin type. Particularly vulnerable are those with the lighter coloured skin types adapted for the northern mid to high latitudes where UVR levels are relatively low. In terms of UVR exposure, the New Zealand European resident population could reasonably be de defined as a climatically displaced one given the large differences in UVI between New Zealand and the areas in the Northern Hemisphere from which most trace their ancestry. So a substantial proportion of the resident New Zealand population is potentially exposed to seasonal levels of UVR significantly higher than those experienced by their recent ancestors. So a clear and comprehensive program of policies and practices for primary prevention is well justified. Migration studies indicate that moving from 
a relatively low to a relatively high UVR environment before adulthood significantly increases the risk of melanoma among those with fair skin. This suggests that early life exposure may trigger initiation processes that increase later skin cancer risk. So although excessive UVR exposure at any time of life increases risk, protection early in life is probably particularly important, and we're coming back to this later. With respect to socio-cultural factors, a key factor in this process is body clothing coverage or skin exposed during outdoor work, social and recreational activities. Quite radical normative changes occurred in clothing during the 20th century in Western cultures, with body clothing coverage reduced substantially amongst both males and females during the period of a single lifetime. This postcard view is of recreational activities at St Clair Beach in Dunedin from the Hocken Library collections, and it dates from around 1906, as does this one here. See the use of hats and parasols and covering clothing was routine. The significant changes in body coverage from about 1910 to 1980 are well summarised in these photographs of US participants in sports and recreational activities, 1910 at the bottom and 1980 at the top. Now, taking account of, of a latency period of as much as 40 years, the New Zealand Cancer Registry statistics for malignant melanoma skin cancer show a remarkable pattern of steady increase from its baseline in 1948. Note the peak around uh, here is an artificial one because of the requirement and new legislation to register melanoma at that time. But the steady increase you can see continues through. Although a fraction of this observed increase may be attributable to better case identification, identification in recent times, the relative visibility of skin cancers is likely to minimise that effect. So in 2012, the year for which we have the most recent data, melanoma was the third most commonly registered cancer amongst both males and females in New Zealand. And using the International Agency for Research on Cancer Comparable Statistics, Internationally, we see that New Zealand is the world leader in age-standardised melanoma registrations and fatalities overall, when male and female rates per 100,000 are combined. The gender-specific rates are more than double those for the US and the UK. And earlier this year, Prof um, David Whiteman came from Australia and told us that our rates had overtaken those that were reported in Australia. But the overall skin cancer burden is actually far greater than this because many types of skin cancers, known as keratinocyte cancers, although much, more, much less likely to be fatal, are far more common and place a substantial burden on the New Zealand community in terms of health system, economic and personal costs. These New Zealand skin cancer cost data are 10 years out of date. Unfortunately, no one's seen fit to fund an update of these statistics, so um, we can't accurately quantify the total skin cancer burden at the moment. It's almost as though no one wants to know, but I believe there are some studies that, in Wellington here at the University of Otago that might be helping in this respect. Now, to put this burden in perspective, in perspective the, uh, the 486 deaths here from all skin cancers um, compares in the same year to 308 deaths from road traffic crashes that year. That is 178 more deaths. And a comparison like this made in Sweden produced a similar finding and was used there to motivate prioritisation of skin cancer prevention, something we could think of doing here. Because of the large number of people affected, an estimated 67,000 per year in the, the keratinocyte cancers, the conservative estimate of total treatment cost, other than melanoma, is around 10, sorry, around 10 times that for melanoma, as you can see down the bottom here. And of course, this doesn't take into account the recent uh, costly drugs for keep treating melanoma. Now, the saddest thing about all this is that this burden of health system cost and personal suffering borne by the New Zealand community is mostly preventable. We know that ultraviolet radiation is carcinogenic to humans. IAC classified it that way several years ago. 
we understand the causal pathways that lead to skin cancer, making preventive interventions worthwhile. We know that 90% of melanomas and 95% of non-melanoma skin cancers are potentially preventable. And reduced UVR can reduce the number of nevi, which may lead to melanoma, solar keratosis and squamous cell carcinoma. And limiting exposure during high summer UVR is the most important strategy. The plausibility of increased vulnerability to basal cell carcinoma or melanoma from early life exposure, then that's where the potential greatest gains are likely to be made. So there's potential for prevention by targeting modifiable environment, behavioural and risk factors. Sorry about that rather dense slide, but I think it's important to go through those things. And knowing the conditions that put many New Zealanders at high risk and following the prompts provided by the Haddon Matrix and the Ottawa Charter Models, a comprehensive program of feasibility, feasibly protective <coughs> environmental, socio-cultural and behavioural strategies can be identified. But are the intervention programs that incorporate such strategies effective in changing protective practices when implemented? In order to investigate this question, a series of systematic reviews has been undertaken. And since 2011, Bronwyn McNow and I at the University of Otago have been privileged to be included in the review team. This rather busy slide, sorry about that, it shows a modified version we've created of the analytic framework that's used for this review. And um, looking at educational and behavioural, individual focused um, strategies, looking at institutional focus, environmental and policy regulation, and looking particularly um, the behaviours limited, uh, listed in, in box three here, is the um, outcomes that we want to see changes in those practices. And eventually, of course, changes in these outcomes in boxes four, five and six, longer term. Given the often long latency period, few studies have been able to follow up right through until skin cancer outcomes. But many studies have looked at behavioural changes and some have been able to look at intermediate health outcomes. This review focuses only on behavioural and health-related outcomes, as these ones here, and not on attitudes, knowledge and beliefs in the um, second box there, because the lack of clear association of these things with desired behavioural outcomes. Now, the review, review focus has six settings and three broader strategies that we're looking at that cut across those settings. And the conclusions have been mostly positive, with five reviews concluding that it was either sufficient or strong evidence of effectiveness. If we look in greater detail at one of the settings for which the evidence was determined as strong, and that is primary and middle school settings, we can see the sorts of changes achieved. With respect to the outcomes of interest in the left-hand column here, these are things that we want to see happen. More use of these things, less sunburn, less nevi, avoidance of harmful sun exposure. Results consistently demonstrated beneficial effects. And some of these changes were quite substantial, such as the two physiological outcomes in red, where the incidence of sunburn and emergence of new nevi showed significant reductions. It's these two here. And these were quite notable findings. From the review series overall, that's all the different um, contexts and settings, some general conclusions can be drawn about what may help improve intervention effectiveness. And these, I guess a lot of them are self-evident when really, you think it through, but it's important that there's a significant, sufficient level of investment to have a program, that the program is of high enough intensity to have an effect, that its program is consistent and sustained over time, and you need to pay attention to how the audiences that you're targeting the program at, how they're reached, whether through information provision or something like a more persuasive approach. And it's important also to be able to work through existing organisational structures such as schools and workplaces. In the review series, so this 
we'll have guides as to what, what's needed in New Zealand. But getting back to New Zealand and looking at the historical sort of development of uh, responses to skin cancer here, what's been happening? Well, we had very promising initiatives in the 1980s and 1990s and similar patterns of recommendations made by um, Professor Elwood and Helen Glasgow in the 1993 report and then by the Public Health Commission in 1994. So more than 20 years ago, recommendations were made for a comprehensive primary prevention program. And school settings were designated as a high priority. The Public Health Commission provided some detail around how interventions in schools could be assessed and evaluated and improving the education, oh, sorry, the, the education in the school facilities to moderate sun exposure, keeping schools aware of the resources available for, in their curriculum for education, incentives, um, awarding certificates to schools for adopting practices and implementing policies, and these sort of things um, as school practices and, and policies. This sounds a little bit out of date now. People don't like giving away things anymore, it's all user pays, but that was something that was mentioned at the time that would lead to better use in schools probably. And the important thing was to evaluate whatever program was introduced, so, um, probably by looking at the increase in the percentage of schools that adopted and implemented such policies. Now, a number of uh, factors make school-aged children and schools important targets for skin cancer prevention uh, interventions. Early life exposure, as I mentioned earlier, is a plausible risk factor for skin cancers. And young people spend a considerable amount of their time at school, including in breaks, recreation and sport. There are opportunities for establishing some protective institutional policies and practices, uh, influencing the school physical environments, and having things in the curriculum content that meet educational obligations to inform of risk as well as informing about scientific issues and so on. There's the opportunity to increase student knowledge and establish lifetime normative sun protective behaviours. And there's also a need to meet Ministry of Education and ERO administrative expectations regarding health and safety. And these, um, known as NAGs, this is a good <laughs> short term for them, National Administrative Guidelines, there are clear guidelines and expectations for schools. We had to um, ensure that the school's buildings and facilities provide a safe, healthy learning environment, NAG4, and provide a safe physical and emotional environment, NAG5. And no, it doesn't specifically identify sun protection. These guidelines can be taken to include the provision of adequate shade and appropriate sun protection practices for avoiding erythema and assisting skin cancer primary prevention. In the absence of any explicit official efforts to routinely ensure that schools are sun protective institutions, the Cancer Society's Sun Smart Schools Accreditation Program aimed to fill the gap and was launched nationally in November 2005 with these criteria here um, in terms one and four, guided by the WHO recommendations for program comprehensiveness. And at this point, we researchers took up the challenge to assess school sun protection practices and policies and environments. But since all divisions of the Cancer Society were keen to immediately and comprehensively implement the program, we were not able to randomly select a control group. They were so keen, and it's, it's hard to explain to people that need, but never mind. We did identify a random sample to assess at baseline, and almost 80% of those schools um, were followed up four years later. This was our system of selecting roughly a 10% sample. Now, as the bar chart here illustrates, we found an increase in the highest scoring group of schools, and in the table at the bottom, um, a statistically significant uh, sh positive shift in the total accreditation scores from 2005 to 2009 when we followed them up. However, only just over 4% of schools met all 12 criteria at the time in 2009. When we ranked the percentage of schools attaining each accreditation component, the top red bar shows almost 40% of schools had not yet developed sun protection policies. 
we identified three other areas, the other red areas down the bottom, most requiring attention in order to get schools over the line. That's integration of sun protection policy practices into the um, curriculum, shade provision in the school and clothing. There have been some improvements in three low attainment areas of clothing, shade provision and curriculum content, as these figures here show. Um, but no more than 11% improvement at the best over that period of time. It's also instructive to see that acknowledgement of program promotion from by the Cancer Society Health Promotion staff, schools that acknowledged that actually performed better, statistically significantly better. And we drew some conclusions from these the shortcomings that were noted. For, with respect to clothing, um, it was the criterion reported least often in New Zealand schools and not only at the baseline but four years later, it's 43%. And this is in sharp contrast to Australian schools where clothing use is the criterion most frequently mentioned, 96% they report. So this requires working with designers, manufacturers and distributors to make clothing more affordable and practical in collaboration with students and caregivers. So that the products are attractive and acceptable. Um, this is a slide of some Danish students before the summer months preparing, they had a project to prepare some protective hats. It's something that we could perhaps introduce in New Zealand as well. <laughs> but I'm not sure that they'd be, well, they may be pretty effective. Quite nice to look at too. Regarding shade provision, um, we thought that it required greater financial support and incentives. This is probably a key point, actually. There's need for professional support for optimal design and placement of shade, and there's need to implement shade audits in schools to see what's going on. We gave a presentation to the Ministry of Education, Property and Infrastructure staff about this, and subsequently the Cancer Society had dialogue and correspondence with the minister and officials, and received a ministerial letter acknowledging the need for shade in future building of schools, particularly uh, being undertaken in Christchurch at the time, but we're still awaiting quantitative data on progress. There's a wide range of structures that could be built more widely. This was a sort of time out for students who were not wearing hats. Um, it's quite a, a nice veranda, it provides warm shade. Another veranda where the excludes this high sun shade, high level sun from the seats and allows low level sun in winter to get in. And a covered area for a, a sand pit. And Ryan Gage provided me with this slide of a study that's going on at the moment. It covered outdoor learning areas, colas, this different sort of cola to the one that you drink. But very effective for providing a light and protected area. There's also natural shade, of course. With respect to curriculum resources, where there was a need to improve the accessibility of them and to integrate them better into the curriculum structure and to promote them more to schools and teaching staff. And also, <coughs> we have to note, which is positive, that as good progress was made with developing resources for levels one to four, that's years one to nine up to secondary level. And, but this was paid for and developed in association with educational contractors by the Cancer Society and made available online in July 2014. Ministry of Education found them very useful, I think, but didn't contribute anything towards the cost. So these uh, curriculum resources are cross-curricular. They cover numeracy, literacy, health and science. They explain science concepts and experiences of the sun, energy, and sun protection, and they focus on students learning and using behaviours that will keep them from exposing their skin to excessive levels of UVR. And teachers can either use a full unit um, in a school term or use a single lesson. Now, returning to the SunSmart Schools Accreditation Programme in general, following the criteria that we used in 2009, only 4.2% of schools for primary students at that time met all, met all 12 criteria. But by, 12, by 2015, just over 35% of schools, that's down the bottom here, 
primary schools were accredited by the Cancer Society, but with a substantially lower proportion in the more populous Auckland region where the UVI levels tend to be reach higher levels for longer. Now, these figures shouldn't be taken to reflect negatively on health promoters' efforts because without significantly greater investment, in particular given the cost of shade, it will be difficult to extend the program universally and equitably throughout New Zealand because just of the costs involved. The appropriate source of this greater investment should be really property, school property infrastructure funds. And without that, despite heroic community fundraising efforts, many schools are likely to be unable to be accredited, however well the dedicated Cancer Society staff promote this program. And many primary schools will fail to meet health and safety NAGs 4 and 5. It should be clear that the ultimate responsibility for this lies with the Ministry of Education and the Education Review Office. Now, recently, we carried out a baseline survey of 211 secondary schools. We found that only 50% had a written sun protection policy. And when we assessed their reported sun protection practices according to 11 criteria down the, down the side here, um, similar to the ones used for primary schools, I want to draw attention to three key observations. First, when ranked, the percentage of schools reaching each criterion clearly indicated four areas of what you could call in educational terminology low achievement. And this, we reduce this to three areas when we combine the breaks and events plan together. So clo shade, clothing and outdoor events. The shade criteria is, is again is the, is the least often met. And when we constructed a simple additive total sun protection score, the mean overall score in the top right-hand panel, the green panel up here, was quite modest, just under five out of a possible score of 11. And 65% of schools scored, scored five or less. And only a single school met all 11 criteria. When all the known school demographic characteristics were adjusted for, two statistically significant predictors of higher scores stood out. One was being a school that included primary classes, like some of the larger rural and district schools. And such schools presumably have a continuity in the SunSmart program, so that's a logical and feasible finding. And we also found that being a school that had a SunSmart policy was predictive of better scores. So we concluded that efforts should focus on those things, development of a policy in all schools, and encouraging links with primary classes, not necessarily in the same school, but with other schools around. So the program could be given some continuity. And we also concluded that efforts needed to be focused on shade provision, some protective clothing, and breaks and outdoor event planning and also finally to develop continuity with the established primary level curriculum, develop that into the secondary school levels to make it universal, equitable and a sustainable program. And again, the regulatory agencies need to accept responsibility for ensuring the appropriate sun protection policies and practices are in all public schools and they meet those health and safety guidelines. My colleague Bronwyn McNow recently carried out an observational study in 11 secondary school sports days in Dunedin, which confirmed a generally poor level of sun protective practices. Many students had no alternative to standing around in the sun for long periods while waiting to compete in their events. Um, and fewer than 5% actually were wearing sun protective hats while they were waiting around. Only about half of the schools provided sunscreen to students attending these outdoor events. Yet the UVI at the time was more than double the level at which use sun protection is recommended by the WHO. OK, now taking a step back from detail about schools, I want to comment more broadly about the current situations that affects all places, outdoor work, recreation, sports facilities and so on. In 2012, the US epidemiologist Diane Lazovich said, it's time to get serious about skin cancer prevention. And in 2014, the US Surgeon General 
issued a call to action to prevent skin cancer. Acknowledging that skin cancer was a serious public health concern that we cannot ignore, time to, for a comprehensive approach to prevent it, and the word prevention cannot be emphasised enough. We can truly have a significant impact on skin cancer related illness, death and healthcare costs, was his conclusion. And this is backed up by an editorial in the leading um, medical journal, The Lancet in the UK, saying that when a cure is still a long way away, all efforts should be concentrated on prevention. Unfortunately, we haven't heard calls like this in New Zealand. Now, another thing that, that's really important to take into account is that there's an increase in cancers and in Australia, this has been well documented, we don't have such good data in this on quite a significant fourfold increase over that period of time in Australia. And in the US, the skin cancer treatment costs have increased 126% between 2002 to six period and 2007 to 11. And the annual spend increased more rapidly for skin cancers than any other cancers. In a review of 16 studies and 11 cost effectiveness studies, the mind boggles, it's hard work doing all that stuff. Um, they found Australia and New Zealand had the highest direct public health system skin cancer treatment costs of all countries. And they also recent studies have shown that skin cancer prevention initiatives are highly cost effective. Investing Australian $5 million a year would save $40 million after a 10 year program and at least $3.50 Australian saved for every $1 invested in a SunSmart program there. But we lack New Zealand investment, and yet we have a proportionally greater resource loss given the much higher skin cancer rates that we have than, say, example, in the US. So we in New Zealand should focus more on primary prevention. Because, as I've said, more than 90% of skin cancers are considered preventable. And with the world's highest international melanoma incidence rates, New Zealand has much to gain from primary prevention, more than anyone else. The best avenues for reducing the burden of melanoma in New Zealand, for example, two epidemiologists concluded, are prevention of excessive sun exposure and early diagnosis. Other researchers have noticed that the high numbers of non-melanoma skin cancers, that's the old terminology, that they may have actually been increasing in numbers, though we don't have that well documented yet. And there are very high skin cancer treatment costs to the health system, and also high costs, personal costs, to those who are affected. So primary prevention interventions can be effective and cost effective, we know that now. Perhaps we should focus on what we really need to do. We need to acknowledge, again, that it's time to get serious about skin cancer prevention in New Zealand. We need to follow the Surgeon General's lead and identify skin cancer as a serious public health concern we cannot ignore. We need to invest in prevention to reduce avoidable suffering and conserve future spending on, on treatment. And this funding could be spent on other things in the health system. We need to initiate a high profile program to guide New Zealand institutions, and this program should be adequately funded, sustained long term, well coordinated, co comprehensive and consistent. And it should affect not only schools, workplaces, um, sports grounds, council facilities, anything associated with UV exposure. And there needs to be a demonstration of effective leadership in New Zealand. In Australia, they banned some bids. Here, we're still dithering about the legislation after two years of discussion. And this is a no-brainer. Otherwise, if we don't do these things, New Zealand risks continuing to be a world leader in a preventable disease rather than a world leader in prevention. And we hope that these children from the Sawyers Bay School in Dunedin will go forward to a, a happy and healthy adult life because of their SunSmart school and take a note from these um, surf lifesavers looking into the future and being well protected in their activity. Thank you.
Oh, well, th thank you very much, Tony, for a very informative uh, lecture this evening. Uh, and, and I think it's a tribute uh, to you that even though it, there's some very simple uh, practical solutions, it's very poignant that we are moving into summer and we should take notice of them. And I also uh, was very interested in what we would term in government your social investment model, uh, costing out uh, you know, the cost of prevention versus the cost of treatment. So uh, thank you very much for that. So we've got time for some Q&A. You might want to come back up here. Don't you? I don't plan on answering the questions. <laughs> um, where, would anyone like to, to kick off? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'll move out of your way. Okay. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. Um, um, I'm my question is, uh, by looking at this picture, you know, like, okay, we have protected their head and the face. What about their arms, you know? Is, so. Well, there's a possibility they might, oh, sorry, you get that for the microphone. <laughs> there's a possibility they can be wearing sunscreen <laughs> because it's very difficult to actually tell from photographs where people are wearing sunscreen. I'd have to go up and take swabs off their arms to see. But they're actually doing quite well compared to a lot of schools. And if they are wearing sunscreen, they're pretty well protected. So that, that would be my answer to that. Um, it, it is um, impossible to find sun hats in New Zealand with protection for the neck. Have you any comments on that, please? Yeah, I think it's very unfortunate that these uh, caps that have got very wide uses and covered in corporate logos and promoted and worn by an, our Olympic team in Brazil, what a bad example that was when they could have been wearing broad brimmed and, you know, caps with necks. Um, coverage that would roll up and down. Um, I don't mean on the field, but I mean they were spending a lot of time off the field. What a, what a poor example that was. Looking back, they didn't have very good advice, I think, about that. So it, yeah, it's really sad that there isn't the promotion of the broad brimmed bucket hats and the um, legionnaire type hats in New Zealand. And there's so, such a high profile given to the um, yachty's um, peaked cap, which is basically for protecting the eyes from dazzle and glare and so you can see what you're doing. It doesn't protect any, give, give, virtually no protection for the neck and the cheeks and so on. And which, these are areas which are very high frequencies that can, skin cancers occur in those areas. Uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, Shane Nahu from the Cancer Society in New Zealand. Um, Firstly, I'd just like to say thank you very much, Tony, for the uh, wonderful uh, presentation and also the, uh, the long-standing relationship you've had with the society. Um, your wisdom and uh, mentoring has been very much appreciated over a number of years. Um, I think you made some very valid points uh, around where skin cancer prevention sits in the New Zealand landscape, and unfortunately I think um, it's not as high profile and priority as we would like it to be. Um, your strategy points I think are all well made and well known. The challenge that we all face I think is actually then how do we transition this into a policy response. I think there's a role of a number of agencies here including government, um, including board of trustees um, and we the Cancer Society obviously are very uh, a key um, stakeholder in this. Um, what I'd like to um, work with uh, yourself and others is actually how we broaden that, that stakeholder grouping because at the moment really Unlike most other cancers, um, skin cancer has, I mean, ultraviolet um, exposure. It's really s it's skin cancer and some eye issues. There's nothing else. Unlike smoking, where there's a whole lot of other related health issues, so there's a whole lot of other people interested. So it's how we generate the, um, the urgency behind this. And sun, sunburn's more than just a red face. How do we make that evident for people? Yes, it's been, this area has been something that's a bit like trying to push a heavy barrow uphill, actually, whereas some other things seem to get uh, traction easier. This is something that doesn't seem to have got traction. Although we've had the uh, leadership way back in the 1990s about what, what should be done, and we had a, a cancer control strategy which identified skin cancer as being a priority, and then somehow that dropped off the list, and 
there's been a high priority, for example, for uh, drugs for treating melanoma patients in the advanced stages of melanoma, which is quite appropriately, you know, that, that they should have the best drugs that are available. But it needs to have a strategy that stretches across the, the whole cancer control continuum, you know, from prevention, early detection, through to treatment. And it's been, it's a pro, at present, it's very unbalanced. The investment is all in the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff and nothing at the guardrails at the top of the cliff, virtually nothing. And of course the Cancer Society is the, virtually the only agency that spends any money in this area. Um, the Health Promotion Agency has done some good work, but their funding has been reduced steadily over the years. And even recently it's been cut back again in the area of, of um, skin cancer prevention, which is very disappointing. But I think there is an opportunity later this year for when the uh, skin cancer I was remember forgetting the name of it, Early Detection and Primary Prevention Committee Working Group, whatever it's called, meets later this year. I think it's next month. We're preparing some documentation for them now, actually. There may be an opportunity to develop some of those things you're thinking about through that strategy and, and build those links um, with, you know, like I say, boards of trustees, employers, sports, you know, groups, all sorts of groups. So that's, that's a possibility, I think. And that's just on the horizon this summer. Yes, hi there. This has been a very interesting talk. Um, I lost my father to squamous cancer. And um, I'm so covered up most of the time I take vitamin D tablets. Um, I've been reading a, a bit and I've got a bit confused now. I think um, you're saying that we've got mostly UVA and some UVB. Am I right that, you know, the shorter the wavelength, the worse it is for cancer? But what about the story for vitamin D? And um, can we get a sunscreen that's really effective for skin cancer? but doesn't take a further toll on trying to get enough vitamin D. It's very tricky, actually, because the, um, the biologically sort of active areas, the, the, you know, the, the, the part of the spectrum that produces the endogenous production of vitamin D from action on the skin, is also pretty closely overlapping with the area that, of the spectrum that produces erythema. So when you, you're blocking one, you tend to block the other. So that, that sorry? That's mainly the UVB, but also some in the, in the UVA part of the spectrum as well. So that, it is a challenge. So personally, I, I would say that people who um, think they're low on vitamin D would take a supplement. It's an easy thing to do. It's a harmless thing to do. And it's very hard to get um, sufficient vitamin D from your ordinary nutrition. You'd have to eat like more eggs than you can imagine. <laughs> um, so yes, take them as supplement. And there are like little sprays. I found some the other day, you know, you just spray every morning. You get a, a thousand international units. Um, but of course, these, these things tend to be inequitable across the population. So people are going to best afford to do these things and are best educated tend to do them, which works against the people who are, you know, disadvantaged in some way. That's, that's the difficulty. There's a sort of a challenging area around here, I agree. May I just ask a quick supp supplementary? <laughs> uh, as a mother of um, two small children, uh, when, when you go to play centres and ECEs, uh, kind of the, the catchphrase is, don't put sunscreen on your child before 11, let them go out in the sun, and then put sunscreen on your child. Um, given you put up some lovely graphs with all of the variables, um, with respect to preventions and, and exposures to, to skin cancer, what, what practically, if you're not taking supplements, should you do? Is that correct advice or is well, it's reduced an, advice? It's, it's <laughs> important to get some exposures to the sun. Um, but as, you get, as people get older, and, and particularly in, in advanced old age, the process of of um, making vitamin D isn't so efficient, so those elderly people definitely need supplements. Um, but 
earlier in life, it's, it's important to get some exposure, and that's the sort of catch here. Some of these children might be getting some sun exposure in their arms, which from the point of view of vitamin D. I don't know the time of day here. You can work it out from the shadows, probably. Ryan will probably be able to <laughs> calculate that. But um, it's important to have some exposure, and probably earlier in, in the morning would be a good time. As what, what they don't want is for parents necessarily to put the sunscreen on before they leave to go to, to school or to their ECE because they don't get any exposure at all. And they might, if they don't have it on early but put it on around that sort of time or whatever time they think is appropriate because they're probably looking at the UVI levels, yes. um, that it's good to have that exposure at the time that's at least risk. Kia ora, um, Tony. Thank you very much. It's Louise Signal from University of Otago. Thanks so much for that uh, incredibly thorough uh, walk through what is, I think, a, 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 a greatly neglected area in this country. And, and like Shane, I think that we do need to try and broaden the uh, um, coalition, if you like, of uh, mm. people uh, understanding just how urgent this is and what actions are needed to be taken. We at the university are uh, in the business of doing research, as, 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 as you know, and I wonder what research agenda you might want to suggest for us going forward. I think there's a real lack in New Zealand of um, like rigorous quantitative research in these areas actually. In fact, as you know, I'm part of the review team working with the CDC in Atlanta looking at research and one of the distressing things is we look through this huge pile of studies and we find this has got faulty statistics, this is not designed well, the sample wasn't selected appropriately. You know, it's, and so you can't take a lot of, um, you know, from their conclusions. So it's really important that when you do things, you do things rigorously, that the studies are well designed, the measures are, are valid and reliable, that you've got a large enough sample for the, do your statistical tests and so on. And so much research, so much effort is, is wasted, I find, overseas anyway, in, in not doing those things. And so if we're going to do things in New Zealand, we should do them well. I think that's the most important thing. Um, whatever funding we get, we should use it e efficiently. And we could, we could choose any areas to work in, really. It could be in sports or in recreation. It could be in, in more in schools, as, as you're, and Ryan and yourself are doing. It could, we are, it's a big lack in workplaces at the moment. And of course, we've got WorkSafe New Zealand, which is something I... I was hoping the minister was going to come along tonight, right. actually, so we could develop a relationship with that. <laughs> um, the need for uh, <laughs> sun protection in workplaces and that being considered an important protective practice. That, that's another area that's a real gap in. Mm. And we found in our study of um, workers in Central Otago where we got them to wear UV dosimeters. It was the first study of its kind, actually. Dosimeters designed by NEWA and, and worn by a large sample of outdoor workers. We found that quite a lot of them actually reached their, what, what should be called the, the maximum exposure that they should have in, in a matter of a few minutes in the middle of the day. Hello, just wondering if you could comment on the cost of sunscreen, particularly for low-income um, families, and um, what sort of taxes do we impose on sunscreens in New Zealand? I'm not sure about the tax situation, actually, but um, it was interesting you say that because looking back at those recommendations from 1994, I think it was about low-cost or subsidised sunscreen in schools, that was, that was the reason for saying that. But things have gone very market-orientated and user pays since that sort of time. There's been quite a shift away from that. But uh, in schools, I think that's, that's a particular environment where something like that could and should be done, really. And early childhood centres probably as well. Because the, the, there is a risk that people get doubly disadvantaged, you know, a disadvantage to start with. And then if they can't do these, the things that you know, probably they know they should be doing, they're advantaged, disadvantaged again. So they're doubly disadvantaged, yeah. That's something that definitely could be promoted, given given the scale of the problem in New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. We have a couple more. Thank you very much. Um, just wondering, um, 
the studies that, that you've described seem to be sort of what every three years or every five years or something of that sort. Are, are there uh, metrics that you could suggest um, which could be measured perhaps annually to hold each government each year <laughs> responsible to say this is what has happened positively or not each year? Are there some key metrics to hold a government responsible multiple times during its tenure rather than only once in its tenure? Thank you. I would think like um, it's really the responsibility of the Education Review Office to to assess these things in schools and it's part of those nags four and five that they should be assessing schools on sun protection really and practices in schools. So I don't know how frequently that the ERO gets round to each particular school. I think it's not that frequent actually but that's the sort of thing that um, would need to be done. But also I think it's important to keep track of the number of schools that actually have implemented policies because we found that you know quite a low proportion of schools actually had policies. So that's the first step to get a sun protection policy and then to keep them to that policy, you know, and to monitor that policy as on the ground as what's actually happening. So I think, yes, getting the um, ERO to take us on board more and also uh, having some particular encouragement, some carrots and sticks <laughs> for schools to actually develop a policy and make sure that all schools have them. Not many years ago, it was a sissy only wore hats. Is that a, still a prevalent attitude? No, I don't think so. You know, not amongst uh, the farmers and uh, shearers and outdoor workers who often wear uh, broad-brimmed hats. Um, it's, it's, it's funny that shift in, in fashion that the hats have, have gone out. I've got a whole pile of hats at home. I've got about 20 different hats for different purposes, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't consider myself particularly sissy. I just think it's very practical and sensible and it's actually very comfortable when you're, you're outside reducing the glare, reducing the burn and knowing you're protecting yourself. And actually there's something quite attractive about a hat that's well worn, I think. And, you know, from those old photographs, the ladies in 1906 certainly knew this with these beautiful broad brimmed hats with flowers and goodness knows what all over them. I mean, Bring it back. <laughs> bring, bring the hats back, for goodness sake. They're beautiful. <laughs> thank you. Oh, look, thank you very much, uh, Tony, again, for that very informative uh, presentation. And thank you very much for your time in answering those questions. Uh, to all of you in the theatre here, thank you very much for those very intelligent questions. You'd be welcome in select committee any time. <laughs> And thank you, Helen, for uh, your work in putting these series on. It's, it's lovely to have you here in Parliament, and I look forward to next year. Um, hopefully you've got some plans. Uh. <laughs> yes, thank you, Helen. Um, and thank you, um, Ilka, for, uh, with the mic running around. She's disappeared. I think she's uh, getting the refreshments probably organised. So you're all invited now um, to go into the East Wing for some refreshments. If you didn't get to ask your question of Tony, I'm sure you can accost him um, over a, a, a beverage or two. And look, thank you once again, Tony, for your time. Thank you very much for tuning up. It's been a pleasure. And again, a very, very informative uh, lecture. Uh, thank you very much for, for taking that time. Thank you.